I've had the great privilege over the years to be a part of many different prayer groups. Now, admittedly, some were more enjoyable than others, and some were much more blessed than others, but each had a value and a purpose and touched my life in some way. And it was in these groups that I had the opportunity to listen to many different people as they engaged in prayer which is actually communication, communion with God. And this is where I proceeded to hear many different things, many different approaches, attitudes, and formalities that people had about God and about prayer. And through it all, I came to realize one thing in particular, one thing that I want to share with you today one thing that the scriptures make very clear, that prayer is not a formal or mysterious thing. Rather, prayer is specifically, as I mentioned, communication and communion with God. And what I want to share with you today is what this communion and what this communication is really about and what it looks like and how you do not have to stand on formality with God, because he is your father who loves you. He's your daddy. He's your papa. Whatever intimate name you want to use for your father God, that is who he is. And that is how you are to see him. That is how you are to approach him. Not on formality but with intimacy as your Father God and you have communion and communication with one another. Welcome to Thriving Branch. I'm Jim. Today we are talking about prayer, actually continuing about prayer, because we talked somewhat about prayer last week, and today is kind of a continuation of that study last week. Last week we saw about how God, your Father, is attentive and cares for you and already knows what you need before you ask him. And today we're going to continue that theme by answering the natural question that comes up after we dealt with that, which is, well then, what do I pray about? What is, what is prayer? What does prayer look like? And we already touched on it a little bit in the opening, which is that prayer is actually communication and communion with God, your Father your daddy, your papa. And the reason why I mentioned all of the prayer groups that I attended in the past is because it was there where I was able to see people praying. And quite honestly, I was surprised to see how the posture of people instantly changed the moment that they would engage in prayer. You've probably seen the same thing. It shocked me. And please understand that I'm not saying this in a judgmental way. I'm not saying that these people were being insincere. I'm not saying that they somehow weren't genuine. Please don't read that into what I'm saying. Not at all. I'm not saying that. In fact, I'm quite sure that the people were genuine. I'm quite sure that they were being completely sincere in their beliefs. The problem was the spiritual posture that they took. I'm not talking about bowing your head or anything like that. I'm talking about their spiritual posture, which completely changed the moment that they engaged in prayer. The attitude that they adopted during prayer, one which, by the way, Jesus specifically speaks about. And like I said, you're probably familiar with this. You may have seen someone who's very 
lighthearted, very energetic, a very lively person to be around, who speaks in a down-to-earth way and really resonates with you and just brings life to the room. But then, the moment that they begin to pray, everything changes. Their posture, their mannerisms, even their speech changes. The person who was so lively and so energetic and lighthearted before now seems like they have the weight of the world on their shoulders. They start using overly eloquent, even antiquated words when they pray, words that they would never use in regular speech, using Old English these and thous when they talk to God. This has never made sense to me. Never made sense to me. On the one hand, People say that God is their father and that we are his beloved children who he deeply cares for, while on the other hand, we feel as though we can't talk to him normally without completely changing our demeanor and changing our language. Why? Why? Why do we still have this disconnect with God? Why do we still place artificial barriers between us and the one who died to remove every barrier, every wall, every veil. Why? Friend, my heart today is to share with you the truth that will set you free from this, whatever we call this. The truth about how you don't need to stand on any kind of formality with God. The truth that you can be completely open, completely honest, completely relaxed with your daddy God. Take, for example, the wisest man to ever live before Jesus, who walked the earth. It was Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon had gone to the land of Gibeon to offer sacrifices at the high places because as yet there was no temple of God. And in verse 5, we see this. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. Turn there now and read that with me if you can. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. Ready? 1, 2, read. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. Now, a lot of us, we like that one. Now, already, this is not what we might expect, though, from God. Immediately, take note of that, immediately, as soon as God appeared to Solomon, what's he doing? God is already looking to give. He didn't ask anything from Solomon. He didn't test Solomon. He didn't give him some kind of challenge to overcome before rewarding him. He didn't wait to see what eloquent words Solomon would utter either. And this goes hand in hand with our study last week. God is already looking to give. You see, we tend to think of prayer sometimes through the wrong lens, trying to impress God to see if we can actually get him to give us something. Oh, if I could just use the right words and avoid saying the wrong things, then God will answer my prayer. We think that way sometimes, let's be honest. We do think that way sometimes. Oh, I just need to say the right things. But we don't see any of that here. We don't see any of that here in the scripture. In fact, Solomon doesn't even initiate the conversation. As of this moment, Solomon has not said a word. And God is still offering to give him something. Anything that he would ask. Now this is important for us to see the sheer unhindered generosity of God on display here. And what did Solomon do? Well, he went to sleep. He rested. <laughs> and specifically, he rested after the sacrifice was offered. Now, take this fact 
and step back for a moment and see the big picture here. The sacrifice was offered and then Solomon rested. The sacrifice was offered and then Solomon rested. Nothing else needed to happen. The next thing you know, God is appearing to him and asking him what he would like to be given. There's no formality. There's no standing on ceremony. There's no apprehension. No fear. Why do we think our relationship with God is worse than Solomon's? Hmm. Why do we think Solomon has a better relationship with God than we do today in Christ. We have the greatest sacrifice ever to be offered. A sacrifice that's vastly superior to the 1,000 burnt animal sacrifices that Solomon offered at the high places. And yet we rarely seem to experience the kind of thing that Solomon experienced here. And again, I'm not saying that in a ju judgmental way. I'm not saying that to shame anyone. I say it to cause us to stop and think and ask ourselves why. And one of the reasons why we seem to miss this is because we have a false sense of formality. We have a false sense of ceremony and ritual, which Jesus himself spoke about in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to go there in a second. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. Let's take a look at what Jesus says about this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. Ready? One, two, read. And when you pray, don't babble continually like the pagans, who think that God will hear them better if they use many words. Now, I like this. Jesus pretty much nails this point down. And truly, there are people who think that the more they talk and the more eloquent speech they use and the antiquated language they use, that God will somehow or for some reason be more attentive. But Jesus clearly says that this is not true. Instead, Jesus continues on in the next verse, which is verse 8, and he says, don't be like them. Don't be like who? The people who babble continually and use a lot of words. Don't be like them because your father knows what you need before you ask him. Again, this goes hand in hand with our study last week. And take notice of something interesting here. These babbling pagans that Jesus is talking about think that God will hear them the longer that they talk. But you, notice the words he's using here, you know that your father knows what you need before you ask him. Do you see the difference that he's drawing here? It's all about the realization of the relationship. They, the babbling pagans, think that God, just plain God, will hear them because of the words that they use. But you, now it's not them, it's you, know that your Father, not just God, your Father knows what you need before you ask him. It's all about the relationship. It's all about the union. The knowing inside of you, the knowing that God is not distant. He's not a distant God. He's your Father. He's not distant. He's intimately involved and interested in your life because he created you. And not only did he create you, but he cares for you, even going so far to save you from destruction. 
He didn't just create you and leave. He didn't wind up the watch and then leave it over here on the table. No, he's your father, as Jesus points out. And this is the key to it all. Check out 1 John chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. 1 John chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. Read this with me if you can. Ready? One, two, read. And whatever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandment and do what is pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, I want you to take an honest look at what these verses are saying, especially in the light of the finished work of Christ and what Jesus said in the previous verse, which we read. And I want you to answer this question. What is it that we must do to receive whatever we ask of him as Solomon did? What is the one thing that we must do? The answer, believe on the name of Jesus Christ, and the love follows it. You see, the love follows the belief. We often think, well, I need to work on, on loving more. I need to work on loving people more. I need to work on loving God more. No, the belief comes first. The belief comes first. It's not about your work. It's not about your efforts. It's not even about your prayer. It's not about the elegant words that you pray. It's not about the rituals or the ceremonies that you engage in. Rather, what is it about? It's actually about the favor of God. The answer was in the title of today's study. It's his mercy. It's his grace that is upon you because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. All things are given freely with Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. And once we truly realize that we stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not in ourselves, not in our performance, then it will suddenly become an easy thing to talk to our daddy God. It won't be something dreadful. It won't be something intimidating. It won't be something that's taxing or stressful, but it'll be something truly enjoyable, truly fun, something truly light, exactly as it should be for a child to talk to a father. So I encourage you today to drop the charade that many people are constantly engaging in. Take off the mask. Take off the religion. Shed the burden. Realize that prayer is not about trying to impress God or convince him to do things. In fact, he's already done everything. Everything was accomplished. When Jesus hung on that cross and he said, it is finished, it is accomplished, it is paid for, what's left? What are we still asking him to do? He provided everything. He has given all things to you, including himself. He's already given everything freely with Jesus. Instead, what is prayer? Prayer is you communicating in communion with your Father in heaven, your Daddy God, who loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And I say to you, in all sincerity, be blessed.